for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Can't wait to hear about the humble brag. Shalom, Havarim, and hello, friends. It is good to see you on this Sunday morning. And I do need to give you a little warning, a little heads up. Um, We are being live streamed right now. This is our first time doing this as a congregation, and I can actually see on my phone that we have one person watching, so hello (laughs) to the person who is probably my mother. Um, So anything you say can and will be heard across the internet world, so just be aware of that. Mm -hmm, No pressure, right? (laughs) So if I trip and fall down, so I want to make sure to capture that and send it in. Do they even have America's Funniest Home Videos anymore? Okay. (laughs) All right, so anyway, I, I, I want to start today with a few stories. It's been my practice to do so. And um, one of the things that I, I noticed this week, I was, I was reading a short story about the Donner Party. You know, the, you know who the Donners were? The Donners were these, these, um, these pioneers. They were moving out west. And as they're traveling and they're crossing the mountains, they got stuck. And they had to spend the winter in the mountains with no food, with limited shelter, and really limited means altogether. So if you know the story, you know that the way that they were able to survive, or some of them were able to survive, was by resorting to cannibalism. So as I was reading this short story about the Donner Party, it was full of interesting facts and and just theories about them. One of the stories said that they were very humble people. I'm not so sure about that, though, because I've always thought that they were rather full of themselves. I know, it's just not a a Sunday morning worship service unless you have a good cannibalism joke, right? (laughs) That was not funny. Uh Uh-huh, all right, all right. Um, Anyway, (laughs) I've got a few other things I just want to draw your attention to. Actually, this this was something a friend shared with with, uh, the the internet world this week. Um, This is a meme, a picture. I just want to read this for you. We're kind of setting the stage with these, these opening remarks. But my friend shared this post this week. As you can see, there's a white Range Rover in the front. I know it's a little hard to read, um, but he wrote in this post, he says, sorry, I know this is a show-off post. I try not to post stuff like this, but I had to share. When you work hard all your life and you are doing well, you can treat yourself to something nice. I can't express how excited and happy I am. White was the only color they had, but I don't care. I purchased all four of these chairs. See the chair. <laughs> uh, one more image for us this morning. This one, I got behind this car on Friday on the way to Fishersville, and this is a license plate. I know it's a little hard to read from the back. The letters spell out I am a QT. I am a cutie. We're talking about humility today, aren't we? (laughs) Like, I I was behind this car. I really wanted to get up and see the person, but I couldn't see who it was. Like, I just want to confirm if you're you're being honest or not. You know, they say it's not bragging if it's true, but but that's not true. It still is bragging, even if it's true. I am a QT. You're supposed to, no, I see what you're saying. It's not I am, it's I I am a QT. You have to say it out loud in your head. That's all right. That's all right. (laughs) All right. So Cadron pointed out the title of my sermon today is Humble Brag. Are you familiar with that term? Yes. Have you ever experienced a humble brag? It's on Brainchild. I don't know what that is, but that's good. Okay. Brainchild is awesome. You have the endorsement of the Anderson family. A humble brag, this is what you get if you search for humble brag online. This is the the definition of humble brag. 
Humble brag is a noun, and the official definition is an ostensibly modest or self-deprecating statement whose actual purpose is to draw attention to something of which one is proud. I'll give you an example. This is real life example right here. A friend of mine recently started running 5Ks. And she's doing a wonderful job. She's not, not winning these 5Ks, but you know, I'm of the mindset that if somebody finishes a 5K, they are winning. So she's doing all these things. She's trying to do as much as she can. Last week, she ran a 5K in Waynesboro. And she finished this race, her second race in two weeks, her second live 5K race. And she was feeling, I think, okay about herself. She looked at the results, and she had run about a 12-minute mile during this 5K. So as she's there at the finish line, she's feeling all right about herself. This stranger comes up to her. And this stranger says, oh my goodness, the heat today. Can you imagine this heat? Can you feel it? Can you just, you sense it? It slowed me down so much today. This heat is, is killing me. And this heat, it affected my running so much today. It slowed me down. And, and in my, my GPS, it stopped working like partway through, and I think it, it was telling me that I was running like this nine-minute mile the whole time. And then I, I finally, when I got to the end, you know, at least my official race time, it said that I did run under nine-minute mile, uh, nine minutes per mile. And can you believe the heat here again? This is a humble brag, because this woman, she's trying to list all these things that slowed her down. She's like, oh, the heat, it's so bad. Did you notice that? The heat slowed me down. Have you noticed the heat yet today? Making sure you're aware of the heat. She mentions her failure, her failed GPS watch, the, the technology she has with her. That probably caused some problems as well. And then as she's complaining about all these things that went wrong, that are outside of her ability, she makes sure to drop in there, oh, and I did run a sub nine minute mile and maintain that for the entire race. That is a humble brag. It's when you try to, to state something for others to hear, but you do so by bringing yourself down. Oh, I can't believe, you know, it's so hot, and I didn't run my best. That's a humble brag. So when we look at this passage for today, is this a humble brag on Paul's part? Well, let's look first. Verse 1, the very first thing that you read for us today, Cadron. <laughs> I'll put it on the screen. You don't even have to look it up. This is what Paul says. Paul says, I must go on boasting. <laughs> and like, that's not even a humble brag, right? That's just, that's just a brag brag. I must continue telling you how good I am in all that I have done. <laughs> Doesn't even try to shroud it in humility. Well, what I want to do today is, is look at what's really going on here. Because if Paul really wanted to humble brag, can you imagine Paul's humble brag? <laughs> He's like, oh my goodness, it's so hot here today. <laughs> my GPS stopped working somewhere between Thyatira and, and Tarsus. <laughs> and I only was able to convert 32 people and start two churches in my trip. Oh my goodness, it was such a, such a rough trip. <laughs> Is Paul doing a humble brag here? Maybe. But what I want to show you today is Paul's not bragging on himself. The humbling part is him showing his own faults and weaknesses. Who he's actually bragging on is Jesus. He's saying, in spite of all of my weaknesses, God is doing this through me. So what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through this scripture. I'm going to have a lot of scripture for you today. I hope you're ready for a Bible study. Yes, okay. People at home maybe didn't hear you scream and go, woohoo, that's okay. No. <laughs> we're going to walk through this. We're going to look at the scripture, and we're going to understand what I'm saying is Paul's version of a humble brag. Humbling for himself, but bragging on Jesus. All right, so to understand what is going on today, we need to know who Paul is and his life experiences. We know that Paul spent a lot of his time persecuting Christianity. Paul was a Pharisee. He grew up studying the scriptures, studying the Torah, and when this group known as Christians came on the scene, Paul saw them as a threat. So he persecuted this group. It wasn't until he had a conversion experience that he became a Christian himself. 
So Paul goes from city to city, town to town, as a missionary. He's preaching the gospel to these different communities, these different places that will eventually become churches. Now, in this text for today and some other places as well, especially in 1 and 2 Corinthians, we find that Paul has a bit of a self-confidence issue. Now, I know if you read all of Paul's letters, sometimes he seems very confident. Sometimes he comes off a little bit conceited. But if you look at some of the underlying things here, you'll notice that he has some issues with himself. He doesn't have the confidence that you might expect of somebody like Paul. He's dealing with questions of his, his confidence. He feels underappreciated. And he just feels like he's not taken seriously by these churches. So I want to start with 1 Corinthians chapter 9, where Paul begins by asking the question, am I an apostle? Am I an apostle? Like, can you hear that existential angst there? <laughs> Paul's not even sure of who he is at this point. Am I an apostle? Actually, no, he's asking this question rhetorically. Am I an apostle? He goes on to name some other apostles. He talks about Peter. And he talks about the siblings of Jesus, people that converted to following Jesus and spreading the good news. He's asking this church in Corinth, he says, am I any less of an apostle than Peter is? Am I any less of an apostle than these siblings of Jesus? Because I don't feel like I'm getting the same respect as they are. We go on then to chapter, well, actually, if after this, after this, he goes on and he like gives his first resume. He goes through all these people and he says, are they Hebrews? Guess what? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? And he says, guess what? So am I. <laughs> and he says, he says, I have been, I have been persecuted. I have been imprisoned. I have been flogged for the gospel more than all y'all. You know, Paul's from the South. <laughs> I've been persecuted more than all y'all for the sake of the gospel. We begin to see how he just, he's got to argue his case to be a valid, to be considered a valid apostle. So he pre presents his resume. These are the things that I have done. I am born of this lineage. I have done these things, gone to these places. And then in our passage, just before our passage in 2 Corinthians, he kind of ups it a little bit. 1 Corinthians 11.5. Do not think that I am, that I am in the least inferior to these super apostles. I don't think, you know, he, he's lifting up these other apostles saying, they're super apostles, sure, they're great, but don't think that I'm any way inferior to them. And you see, the thing is here, what's going on is, which church is Paul writing to in, in Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians? Not a trick question. He's writing to the church in Corinth. Do you know who started the church in Corinth? Paul. So here he is among the people that he brought the gospel to. Here he is writing this letter to the church that he helped start. And he's feeling like he doesn't get the credit that he is due. He's feeling like they are disrespecting him. And one of the ways that they are disrespecting them, him is that they're not funding his missionary journeys. They're sending money to Peter. They're sending money to the brothers of Jesus. But Paul, their pastor who started that church, is not being funded. So I say, that, <laughs> I say that Paul has a little bit of a Rodney Dangerfield complex. That picture's a little washed out, but you know who Rodney Dangerfield is? I, I've never, never, never heard any of his, of his comedy. I guess he's a little off color at times, and not suggesting it, but Rodney Dangerfield had this bit that he did where he say, I get no respect. And I, I saw one of his, his jokes this week written out. Um, for instance, what he said was, my wife told me the other day she wanted to bake a turkey, but the oven wasn't big enough for me. I get no respect. <laughs> this is Rodney Dangerfield. I get no respect. And that's what Paul is experiencing. He just doesn't feel respected. So why? Why would Paul not feel respected? Why would they not give him the credibility that these others did. Think about it like this. Jesus had how many disciples? 
12. You remember the song? There were 12 disciples. I won't sing it. You're welcome. <laughs> if you go through that list of disciples, how many of them were named Paul? Zero. Paul was not one of the original 12 disciples. Do you know how many times Paul actually met Jesus when Jesus was alive the first time? I have to specify that. <laughs> Any guesses how many times did Paul meet Jesus in the flesh before Jesus was crucified? Zero. Big zero. So Paul never actually met Jesus. He never spent time with him like these other disciples. He didn't grow up in the same household as Jesus did, like his brothers, like Jesus' brothers did. So Paul feels disrespected by these people because he wasn't one of the original and because he never met Jesus. So this is why Paul feels he has to argue. He has to brag. He must boast, as it said in verse 1, about what he has done. He's trying to gain credibility because these people weren't taking him seriously. They weren't taking his teachings seriously. So we come to verse 2 of our passage for this morning. And we read this. Paul says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Paul gets really abstract here. There's some weird stuff going on. I understand that. What we see here, though, is Paul, and he keeps going on. He's like, I, I don't know if this was in the flesh or if this was in the spirit. How did this really occur? Um, Paul kind of talks about this weird experience that a man went through. Who do you think that man was? He doesn't say, does he? He just says, I know a man. I know a guy. It's kind of like that guy that goes to the, you know, he, he, maybe he calls up the doctor on the phone and says, hey, doc, you know, I have a friend who wanted to see if he could fit a battery up his nose. And now he can't get it out. What should I tell my friend? <laughs> Who's that guy's friend? Well, it's really him. You all have been there. Come on. This man that Paul is referring to, it's Paul. He's talking about his experience when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. Remember that Paul, as, as he's persecuting the Christians before he's even known as Paul, he's called Saul. And he's traveling from one city to the next looking for these Christians. He's got a list of people that he should find and check off. And when I say check off, I mean he's going to make sure that they are no longer a threat. <laughs> so he's going from one city to the other, and he meets the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. It knocks him right off his donkey. He sees this light, and, and he says, that here, I don't know if it was in the spirit or in the flesh, or just what was going on, but this guy had this experience. And I think the reason that Paul doesn't go into details as to why it was him that saw Jesus, why he's just like, oh, I know a guy. I think the reason is, is he's trying to remain rooted and grounded in Christ. He's trying to not brag on himself. One of the biggest experiences in Paul's life, one of the most formative events, when he tells the story of that formative event, he is not even the main character in that story. He is not the main character in his own story. So what I see Paul doing is he's trying to take the focus off himself. This isn't about me meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus. This story is about Jesus entering into my life. That's why Paul tells us in like the third person, as if, as if there's some other person involved here. So Paul's like, oh, no, no, I never met Jesus in life when he was here on earth. But let me tell you a story about a guy. Let me tell you a story about a guy that was riding a donkey and got knocked off that donkey by a blinding light, and the Lord spoke to him. Oh, and did I mention this guy still talks to this guy, Jesus, every day? You know, Paul is trying to gain some credibility, gain some respect, without bragging about himself. Now, here's the thing. I, I kind of I feel for Paul. I get the position that he's in, this, this strange tension between wanting to claim his, his credentials and, and claim the things that have happened, but also wanting to remain humble and not sound like he is bragging about these things. So what does he do rather than brag about himself? He brags about what Jesus has done through him. And one of the ways that Paul does this is he lifts up this, this example, this metaphor, and I think it's probably one of the most famous metaphors in this passage, at least in this chapter, where Paul talks about 
his thorn in the flesh. Let's all b agree on something here. Thorns are ouchy. That's, that's, a, that's a theological word for it. It's ouchy. Right? If a thorn is in your flesh, like, uh, Ellie, can you help me out here? Have you ever got hit by a thorn, scratched by a thorn? How's it feel? It feels bad, right? <laughs> we know this. Thorn. You do not let mommy take it out? Oh, okay. But a thorn in the flesh feels bad. Like, we know this. This is not a good thing. Now, who can tell me what is Paul's thorn in the flesh? Help me out. It's torture. In a way. But, like, specifically, what is he referring to metaphorically here? No, we, we don't know. And even people that study Paul professionally, these scholars that spend all their time reading Paul, Paul's letters, um, they can't agree on what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. What we have is a number of ideas of what it could have been. From the context of this scripture, we can see that, that it was a bad thing. And we can see that Paul would rather not have this bad thing. <laughs> so far, not a big leap of faith. We, we get that. But if you look at the context, you see that this thorn prevented Paul from doing what he really wanted to do. It made it more difficult for him to do what he felt called to do. It made it more difficult for him to serve Jesus. And he says this in verse, which one is this? Verse 7. He says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. He calls it a messenger of Satan to torment me. So the scholars will say, yes, this was something that kept Paul from actually going around and, and speaking as he wanted to speak and, and teaching as he wanted to teach. And some, some possible explanations for this or examples, some people say that Paul likely had some sort of ongoing medical condition. And more recent scholarship has suggested that he had some sort of tummy issues. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to get too much detail here, okay? Some people suggest Paul had tummy issues, like what we might call IBS today. And you can see how if you are a traveling missionary, going from one city to another, standing up and preaching to churches, how this might be a thorn in your flesh. This would make it more difficult to do what he felt called to do. Others have suggested that maybe Paul had a severe speech impediment, that he had a difficult time standing up in front of people and talking. And the reason they suggest this is because Paul wrote a lot. He was a scholar, he could write, but when it came time to speaking, you don't find many examples of Paul speaking. I'm trying to remember, was it, was it Paul that was speaking when the guy fell out of a window asleep, or was it someone else? Was it Paul? Yeah. <laughs> so maybe he wasn't that great of a speaker. I don't know. <laughs> um, people, <laughs> no one's falling out of a window while I speak, but you know. <laughs> anyway, um, these are the sorts of suggestions that people make. Maybe Paul had this severe speech impediment. Maybe he had IBS. We can't say for sure, but these are the things that would have kept him from doing what he wanted to do. So Paul had this issue, this thorn in the flesh, and he just said, well, whatever. I'm going to go about life, right? No. Oh, wait. He says this in the next verse. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Three times he asked for God to take away whatever was keeping him from doing his missionary work to the best of his ability. And I, I, it's a bit of a tangent at this point, but I, I always feel when I come to this passage, I need to kind of remind people that um, sometimes our theology around issues of suffering can really be bad. <laughs> um, because we've probably all heard preachers. Uh, what's with preachers, I tell you? We've probably all heard preachers, um, either in person or on television, who focus on healing ministry. And I want to just go ahead and confirm and, and say it again. I believe that Jesus, that God through Jesus heals people. God can heal people. God does heal people. But we've probably heard these, pe these preachers stand up on a Sunday morning or on, on television and say things like, hey, if you really have faith, if you have enough faith, God will heal you. And if you don't have, and if you aren't healed, even if you do have enough faith, it's because of some unconfessed sin in your background. So if you only have faith, you will be healed. If you have 
something in your background that might be keeping you from being healed. You've heard these people say these things before. And I just want to say that's, that's just bad theology. Actually, I want to go further. It's not just bad theology. That's, that's harmful theology. Tell that woman who spent the last three weeks in the NICU only to have her child pass away that if only she had enough faith, her baby would have lived. Tell that paraplegic that was in a car accident that if he just confesses that whatever sin is in his background that he will walk again. Well, guess what? I, I think that guy will walk. He's going to walk away from the faith. Those Examples just don't hold up. Yes, there are times that God heals, heals, but we can't come down to those points and say, if only you have enough faith, if only you confess the sins in your background, that God will heal you. Because we have a really good example here when God did not. Do you think Paul had faith? I mean, I, I expect so. <laughs> the guy turned his entire life around and decided he was going to live for the Lord. And maybe he had some unrepented things in his background. I don't know. But I don't think that's the issue with Paul. Because Paul pleads three times to the Lord to take away the thorn in the flesh. And what happens? God doesn't take it away. Paul goes on to say this, But he, that is God, said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. It, it sounds nice. It sounds pretty, but I, I don't understand. And, and maybe that's the point. You see, I think we make it too simple whenever somebody doesn't experience healing. They're like, oh, maybe you just don't have enough faith, or maybe you have something in your background. Guess what? Paul says there's other options. Maybe we just don't understand what's going on. Now, in Paul's situation specifically, it sounds as if at least Paul understands that God did not heal him because God was going to use Paul's weakness to show God's glory, to show God's power. But I also don't want to go so far as to say every time that we don't experience healing, it's because God's going to use your suffering for some other purpose. I don't want to go that far. But again, what we see in this example is that healing and not healing is much more complicated than we often want to make it out to be. All right, tangent over. <laughs> so Paul says this. He says, God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, but my power is made perfect in weakness. So what do we know about Paul? We know that Paul, based on what we read in the New Testament, helped to start about 20 churches. How many churches have you guys planted today? <laughs> No, 20 churches, that's pretty significant. And which group did Paul minister to? Was he just a, a minister to the, the Jewish people, or did he minister to the Gentiles? He was a minister to the Gentiles. He started out preaching to the Jewish people. They rejected him, and he started preaching to the Gentiles. So Paul helped start about 20 different Gentile churches. And I don't think it's too big of a leap to say, perhaps the churches that we see around the world today are offshoots of the church that Paul helped start 2,000 years ago. Because these 20 churches planted other churches, and those churches planted other churches, and those churches planted other churches, and they spread throughout the world. Again, I don't think it's too much to say that this church might be considered an offshoot of the churches that Paul started 2,000 years ago. What else do we know about Paul? I mentioned that he wrote a lot. Any guesses how much he wrote? He, he wrote a lot, yeah. He wrote more than we even have record of. We know in 1 Corinthians, he refers to the first letter he wrote to the Corinthians. So 1 Corinthians is actually not 1 Corinthians, it's actually 2 Corinthians. Was that clear? <laughs> okay, so he says in 1 Corinthians, in the first letter I wrote to you, so that means even the records that we have of Paul's writings are not the full extent of his writings. Paul wrote between 31% and 48% of the New Testament. It depends on if you go by the number of words he uses or the number of books. He wrote 31% of the words in the New Testament and almost half of the books we have in the New Testament, or he's given credit for those books. Not too bad for a guy with a severe speech impediment and irritable bowel syndrome. I wasn't going to say the words out loud. IBS. Not too bad for a guy that had tummy issues, right? 
So Paul goes through this. He talks about his thorn in the flesh, and, and he's not trying to brag on himself. He's not trying to brag about, here's my experience. I saw the risen Lord in this image, in this vision, whether it was in the person or in, the, in spirit. I don't know. He's not bragging about himself. He's trying to say, look at all that I have done. But it's not me that did it. Because, as he'll say elsewhere, it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. Let's go ahead and bring, about the, bring up the last verse from this passage, because Paul's not done messing with our heads. He says this, he says, That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, <laughs> in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I know we have some sports fans out there. We have some people who are not as interested in sports. <laughs> but you don't have to sit down and watch a full game to know that when a baseball player hits a home run, oftentimes you'll see them do a certain gesture. They'll make a movement or motion. They'll often look through the heavens and say a little prayer. You didn't know that? You've watched a lot of baseball. <laughs> OK. So for those of you that have never watched baseball before, if a baseball player <laughs> hits a home run, sometimes they will look up to the heavens and say, you know, thank you, God. Or, or some will make the sign of the cross on their chest, something like that. Yeah, something like that. Or just point to the, to the heavens. Um, football. Some people, if they score a touchdown, they will take a knee in the end zone and, and thank God for, I guess, helping them catch the ball. You know? <laughs> um, and I'm sure that happens in other sports as well. There's golfers here today. I, I don't know. Do you ever see golfers make any kind of gesture on, you know, on the golf course? You know, thank you, God, for the bogey. And they, they think, I don't know. Well, do, do NASCAR drivers in their post-race interview, you know, thank you, Jesus, for making the number 23 car go fast today, something like that? Something like that. Okay. Well, what I'm trying to point out is these, these people are, are giving thanks to God for the good things that happened in their sporting careers. It's actually not in Ohio State. It's actually the antithesis of Ohio State. That is, that's an Alabama football player. It's not. It's not. Um, and, and you know what? We can, be, we can be kind of critical of these events. Sometimes these people seem to be doing this to draw attention to themselves. And I would have a cr critique of that. But, you know, if somebody's actually just thanking God for something good happening in their life, I'm okay with that. <laughs> That's a good thing. But if you look at this passage from today, have you ever seen a baseball player strike out and then thank God? Have you ever seen a football player drop the game-winning pass in the end zone and then stop right there and, and take a knee and, and thank God for all that they've been given? No, it's, it's actually just the opposite. We, we don't function this way. But what Paul is saying is that in his weakness, God is made known. In his weakness, when God works through him, he is stronger. So, I, I, okay, I need... <laughs> John 3.16, I believe. Um, so I, I need to try to make this somewhat practical today. I've got one more example. <laughs> um, but I need to do a, a little bit of, of pushback and warning on this passage. Not that there's anything that Paul said that was wrong. Paul is inspired by the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that. But sometimes Paul is taken in the wrong way. Um, an actual theological phrase for you is um, when people talk about, in certain traditions, about the human condition about where we are and how we exist, um, they will often use this phrase, total depravity. So certain traditions emphasize total depravity more than others, and some people are extreme to one side on the issue of total depravity. Total depravity is this concept that there is nothing good within you. you know, ever since the fall of humanity, there's been nothing good within you, not any of you, not even the saintliest grandmother among you. There's nothing good within you. You don't even have the ability to desire to do what is good. So this is total depravity. It's like everybody, <laughs> everybody look at your neighbor and say, you are scum. <laughs> Some of you did not hesitate at all. <laughs> not the first time today I've heard that. 
total depravity says there's absolutely nothing good within you. You can't even desire to do the good. Anything that you do that is good, anything that you desire that is good, anything that you speak that is good, is only God working through you. Now, I get this understanding. I get this way of thinking. It makes sense to me. What they're trying to do is separate themselves from God. God is so good. God is so righteous. We are so terrible. There's this huge gulf between us. Between us. I get that. And people develop this concept of total depravity from Paul's writings. The problem I see is that Paul was a Hebrew. Paul was a Jewish man. He was an Israelite. We established that. You know, if, you're a, if you think this guy's a Hebrew, I'm a Hebrew. I'm a, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a descendant of Abraham. And because Paul was a Pharisee, we know that he grew up reading the scriptures, reading the Torah and studying them. So Paul knew that humans were created in the image of God. Paul also knew that humanity maintained at least a glimpse of the image of God within them after the fall. We read about the image of God still in people after the fall of humanity. So I don't think Paul believed in total depravity. Maybe he believed that we weren't perfect, but not totally depraved. So I think that's really the point today. You're not scum, but you're not perfect. So we need a few take-home points for this morning. And the point is that you're not perfect. The person beside you, they also aren't perfect. And this is news to some of you, right? <laughs> no one here is perfect. And that's good news. Because to, this, to the working family out there, the working parents who put in their 40 to 50 to 60 hours a week and come home and they just don't have energy and they feed their kids corn dogs and Easy Mac five days a week. I'm, just off the top of my head. <laughs> Guess what? To that working parent, you're not perfect. But that's okay. God can still use you. To the retiree who wakes up in the morning and their bones just hurt. But you have been asked by your neighbor to help them clean up a tree that fell down in the storm the other day. Or you have this desire to help build a Habitat for Humanity house, but you physically just can't do it. To that retiree, guess what? You're not perfect. And that's okay. God can still use you. To the preachers out there who, who can't string together <laughs> three coherent sentences, but they feel called to the ministry, guess what? That's okay. You're not perfect. God can use you. We began today with Paul feeling like an inadequate, underappreciated apostle who had to boast about his, his, his resume just to get some credibility among these churches, even the church he start, that he helped start. We see this going on, but when Paul boasts, he doesn't boast about himself. He boasts about what Christ has done through him. Christ can use even a person with a strong speech impediment and irritable bowel syndrome to become one of the greatest champions of the Christian church. And if God can use someone like Paul, he can use someone like you and me as well. So if we must boast, let us not boast in what we have done, but let us boast in what Christ has done through us. Let's pray. Loving God, we are not perfect. We have our problems, we have our struggles, but we are not totally depraved. So God, we thank you for giving us gifts and empowering us to do your ministry. And we pray that you help us to maintain our confidence in knowing that you are with us, that you will guide us, that you will help us to achieve the things you have asked us to do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.